All right, all right, all right. Hello, everyone, and thank you guys for tuning in. If you guys are guys going to be listening to this, we have another amazing presenter for the Global Grief Conference 2023, our second annual one. And guess who we got today? We got Jennifer, a.k.a. To Care To Heal. She's in the house today, and she's here to talk about what she's going to be doing at the conference this year. Jennifer, how you doing? I'm doing great, Tony. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for being, thank you for being on here today. Well, I appreciate it. I'm here as Jennifer and my handles on social media, it's 2care.2heal. That's on TikTok and Instagram, also a YouTube channel. Well, I'm going to share with you who I am. I am grieving. I'm dealing with anticipatory grief. I'm a caregiver to my mother who became a widow in 2017. She was married for 47 years because of her being married to my father for so long and I'm I'm my parents only child she did not know how to deal with being alone that's 47 years being alone so when the pandemic hit and we went into isolation I said you know what I will stay with my mother 24 7 and the real reason why I said I would do this on my father's deathbed I told him that she would always be taken care of. He was in ICU, unfortunately. I, I, he, I think he was brain dead, but I, I remember telling him this. I don't know if he heard it. And I kissed his forehead and that was it. And I, I always said, okay, that's my job. So when the pandemic hit and she was like, you're not going to leave me. So since 2020 and really being in the midst of her grief, witnessing her grief, and also with my anticipatory grief with her, it's been a struggle, especially, you know, with the pandemic being inside, trying to isolate. So for me to keep myself going, I actually went through a program to become a certified grief educator. I did David Kessler's um, certification program, which actually just started in 2021. So I was in his inaugural class of people who became these certified grief educators. So I went through the program in addition, you know, caring for my mom and like the world, we're inside. So after I finished the program, I was like, how am I going to make this work? So initially David didn't, well, he had some of us who went through the program, they were volunteering to be moderators in terms of witnessing people with their grief. For some reason, I didn't immediately do that, but I actually listened to a podcast called the D.D. Jackson Foundation, The Power of Now podcast. And I, I actually heard about David through them. And the people who do that, the, the Power of Now, Power of Love podcast, three brothers who unfortunately lost their mom to murder mm -hmm. when they were in their teens. So I think one was about 15, 17, and 21, something like that. They were young. They never knew how to work through their grief and one of the biggest reasons why was first of all flack <laughs> yeah. from, a, from a celebrity family hmm. and they were afraid that if people knew really knew who they were that they wouldn't really get the attention that they needed for their grief mm -hmm. so about five years ago they they created a nonprofit called the dd jackson foundation which is named after their mom Okay. So they do a weekly podcast every week. And before any of all these grief things, I've been listening to them. So in one of their grief uh, podcasts, they're just like, either you can really work with your grief or you can let it eat you up. And from that time, that's when I was like, you know what? I want to do something. So that's why I went through the program, trying to figure out what, what else to do. So that's when actually I was like, you know what? I got to figure out how to be a moderator with David Kessler. So I started in October, 2022, where I help another lady. We actually are a team and we co-moderate a group of sibling laws. So unfortunately she lost her identical twin sister. I had a sister who passed away, even though I said that I'm the only child of my parents, which I am, my father had a daughter from a previous marriage and she was 15 years older than me. Unfortunately, because we lived in different cities, well, states all of our lives. She lived in the Midwest. I lived on the East Coast. We really never got a chance to see each other. And unfortunately, 
we didn't have a very close relationship because her mom put things into her head just just she didn't like me because I, I I grew up with her father essentially that was it right I never looked at my sister as someone who I disliked it was just someone who I really didn't have the opportunity to know and I really wish I had a relationship with her because towards the end of my father's life he was like when I die I want to make sure that you two have each other so when my dad actually before my dad died my sister was diagnosed with um lung cancer she didn't have much time to live and my dad was just like i am not going to bury my child so she was diagnosed with lung cancer in september 2017 my father kept on saying how am i gonna and my father was 82 my dad was like how am i gonna deal with this and my my sister was 50 50, i'm sorry 57 so my dad was like how am i gonna deal with this so i think her diagnosis sped up him be like i'm out so he died basically a month after she um she was diagnosed with cancer but the thing was that even though my dad was sick it wasn't like he was really dying he just had a lot of health ailments his uh he had kidney failure Mm -hmm. he was on dialysis he had um okay so he had a lot of problems (laughs) yeah he had a lot of problems actually we knew he didn't have long to live but when he died it was just you know you're you're not prepared for death at all so when he died what i didn't know and my aunt so my my dad actually has a younger brother and a younger a younger brother and a younger sister they had the same mom but not the same father so there's so many different dynamics when you don't have you know when you're not living in the same household Mm -hmm. especially if um if your mother is different because usually if you're growing up with your mom and you have to have siblings, you're going to be with your mom. Right. When you when you grow up and you have a you might have the same father, but not but um not the same mom. It's a totally different dynamic, and I know that's why my sister and I were at odds. But the beautiful thing about me witnessing people and their grief in the sibling loss room, I'm beginning to really understand my relationship. Yes, I do know my sister. I knew her birthday. I knew some of the things that she didn't like, who she liked, because I hear people who say, you know, I have these half siblings, I don't know them. And I'm like, I actually didn't know my sister. So it's been really cathartic for me to be there, to witness other people, to listen to them, even though we weren't this lovey-dovey siblings, Mm -hmm. I can at least say I had a sister. And two, I can also stop calling my sister, my half sister, which I usually, actually most people didn't even know I had a sister because no one saw her. Right, no right, one, yeah. And then too, this is my father sort of from a previous marriage with my mom. I, I never even put in my head that my mother was a stepmother because we only talked about my sister as her name, which is Sandra. Right. We never said, that's your sister. We never said that my mother was her stepmother. We never had that type of terminology. So, you know, as I'm going through grief and I'm hearing the termino- terminology of sister, you know, father, stepmother, all that. I'm like, we didn't talk like that. It was just the names. Right. So now at this point, what is it now? 2023, I've been doing this witnessing just since October, 2022. I hope to be able to continue to be in this particular room with sibling loss, at least for another year. And who knows if I will continue to do this work with David Kessler, excuse me, sorry about that, um, to do this work with uh, David Kessler, but I feel as though this is something that I'm supposed to be doing and especially dealing with anticipatory grief because I'm with my mom. That's one thing. I really do not hear a lot of people talking about anticipatory grief. You know, they talk about being a caregiver, they talk about this deaf doula, but you never hear, hear the terminology of, how am I going to handle dealing with my parent mm-hmm. who doesn't have, my mom doesn't have Alzheimer's. My mom doesn't have anything killing her. It's just her mind playing games on her. Right. So I, yeah, my mom is 82, but how do I deal with this? Keeping myself busy. So glad I found you guys. You mm-hmm. know, I'm in the little book clubs because of the pandemic. I am shut in. So I have just found a lot of things. I, I do too many online classes giving people money not finishing 
<laughs> not finishing programs. I, I actually signed up to be a deaf doula. Ooh. And what what happened actually when I started the course, my mom was hospitalized quickly. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm not going to be able to finish this course. I asked the people, actually, can I get my money back? They're like, you know, we have, we have our policy, which really wasn't clearly outlined. So then I was like, well, could I donate this course to someone? You know, I'm being very generous. They're like, no, I found that very odd. So I was just like, okay, they, they've given me now an extension to finish it. But I'm like, my mind is not there because I'm working. I'm doing the work right. every day. Yeah. So why do I need to read all this stuff and give them back to me kind of garbage? Because I, and two, I'm doing this during a global pandemic in terms of witnessing my mom's grief, dealing with anticipatory grief. And two, we are, I don't even know anybody within my friend group. I, I actually have a, a group of friends where we talk almost every day about being caregivers. Your girl, me, I have been in the hospital so many times I've lost count. Oh, wow. And it's not because, like I said, my mom doesn't have a terminal illness or anything like that. It's to me, it's a part of mental, but then she did actually fall two weeks ago. That was pretty bad. But sometimes I wonder where does this calm come from? But I know it's part of my purpose in taking care of her. And then too, yes, I am on medication. <laughs> I do have, I do, I have to be, I have to be very honest. I've, had my anxiety issues. Um, I wasn't formally diagnosed until I was in law school. I got sick after my first year of law school. I went to school in Iowa. I'm from Washington, D.C., went into a foreign land, did not know what the heck I was going getting myself into, and I got sick. And I had to take a year off from school, get my head together, get the right, as they would say, cocktail of anxiety medication. And the thing is that back then, this was in 98, a lot of people weren't talking about mental health on a global scale. So I, I was always told, do not talk about it. Do not, do not discuss it. So when I hear people talking about it, I'm like, do I need to come out and say something? So when I think it's appropriate, I'm like, you know, I might share something if I think it will be helpful, but especially as a black female, I think it's very important at times that I do share my story because we don't really see our stories as people of color, not just necessarily black women, but people of color. We don't always tell our stories because the media is always gonna tell you more of what they want you to know from a per from a particular lens. But when you hear about the black woman, the Native American woman, the Asian woman, you know, the Latina woman, it, it, it makes a difference. So I fit into all those spectrums. I did my 23 and me. Yes, I got literally everything in me. I also, I am 0.1% Filipino. Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like black. Like, yeah, I'm like, a, 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 it's like, it's up there between like 98 and 100%. You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> if, you do, if you do the 23 and me, trust me, I was shocked that I'm only 71.6% African. The other stuff, you know, I have so much but that's part of being of the african diaspora you wow. know we have so much of our ancestors in us but then we have some other people yeah. and you just have to kind of either accept it or and you know i'm actually i, I would like to know more about all this english blood that i have in me but then my mother's father was from jamaica and um he we're trying to kind of like really figure it out. And actually in this grief process, I have been doing my genealogy and you might see in my bio, I actually did find out last year before my great aunt died, this was my father's youngest sister, mm -hmm. that I am related to a US president who's living. I'll give you another clue. He's currently on hospice. So that's who I'm related to. Okay. All right. I had I had no I had no clue at all. And I was surprised that she told me this. So, you know, I've been trying to figure out where can I connect the dots. I went on 23andMe, put in the last name of that person. Yes, there are <laughs> some people and I need to ask them, are you? So yeah. 
Okay. I like that. I like for, that. For the sake of all this, you know, yeah. we'll let people do their research and figure it out. That's okay. So. They'll, they, they'll figure it out when they figure it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is your first year. This is your first year presenting, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And, and so what will be your present? What can people look forward to your presentation? For me, it's primarily how I have handled my grief during this uncertain time of the pandemic, being isolated, um, witnessing my mother's grief during a time where I have no one else to really reach out to physically. Everything that we're doing is online. And that's why I'm so thankful for this conference because I, at one point, I'm like, where am I going to find people who understand this journey? And then, Tony, when you found me, I was like, oh, my God, there are other people. But the part, we've known each other for a couple of years now. Yeah. See, they, see she ain't even putting that in there, y'all. She, she trying to make like, she trying to make it like, I, I, I didn't read, I didn't, I didn't know her already. Y'all just see, this is what I be talking about. Y'all, when I say that, they be giving me a hard time. They be giving me a hard time. She didn't even putting that in there. They, they're trying to make it seem like she, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Yeah. But you know what, Tony, you know how I actually did know about you was because of Dr. McKell. Yes. Um, yes. So she was on the Dee Dee Jackson Foundation podcast, which is called The Power of Love. Mm -hmm. Because of her being on that podcast, that's how, you know, I found out, you know, of course, more about her. But then when you reached out to me, I was like, wait a minute, they know each other. So I was like, wait, I'm in a great community because read you, I read her. Of course, I'm pr I'm pretty loyal to, and the reason why I keep I keep on giving love to the DG Jackson Foundation because if it weren't for them, I would not have gone off into doing all the stuff that I'm doing now. So I just want to give them their roses. If oh, they ever watch this, hey Taj, hey TJ, hey, hey. shout out to the DD Foundation, man. Yes, and and, and uh, so yeah. Check them out on YouTube, correct? They yes. are on YouTube. Yeah. Go to their yeah. channel, check them out. Every, I heard that every, they doing some great things. Yeah, yeah. Every Wednesday they do a podcast, and I try at uh, one p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time, which mm -hmm. is uh, four p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm on the East Coast, so I'm trying to remember how to. Do I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, girl. Those dates, those times, especially with Mountain Time, uh, uh, Daylight Saving Times. That that, that yeah. happens. Like, oh man. Uh -uh. <laughs> so yeah, so it makes it a little bit a little bit more interesting right now, right? But shout out to the DD Foundation, though. You know that they're, they're, they're over there doing good things. Um, and yeah. what day are you going to be presenting on? So I'll be presenting on Saturday, April 29th at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll double check that, but it should be Eastern Standard Time. 5 I, I literally believe that is 5 p.m. Eastern Standard and Time. So that would be 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, yes. There's a two hours difference and everything. And uh, so, whew, excuse me. What are you excited about? What are you excited about this year's conference? We talked about this a little bit. We got some. We got some really great things going on, man. I just really, you know, I really love listening to other people's journeys and grief and how they've coped, how they've made a community, how they've made a career, even out of being a grief educator or a coach or anything within that within that realm. I just love listening and learning. For me, for me. I really, to me, I'm more of a very good listener. In fact, I don't really like telling my story. <laughs> I'm very, in a way, I'm, I'm an introvert and I don't really like sharing it, but as it kind of looks like, yes, I am an extrovert in listening and helping other people. But when it actually comes to my story, I'm very shy about it because there's, I have a very complex story about how I grew up. Mm -hmm. I had shared private with you, yes. Um, so I'm from Washington, D.C. My parents were really in these uh, political arenas. My mother is um, a retired attorney. My father had his own business. So I pretty much grew up in a privileged environment. Wow. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, I was in primarily predominantly um, white schools. Had to deal with my issues, but what's interesting, it's interesting I'm saying this, my, my parents were caregivers to my grandmother, my mother's mother, when I was about seven until I was nine. We had to deal with her anticipatory grief. She died when I was nine years old. That was probably like the first time I was really dealing with grief, but there was no one talking to me about it. Right. And what was interesting, I went to these, I went to a Quaker school and a Catholic school. 
and some of these schools we had like a mandatory um chapel and that was really the one time that I was kind of like I would say I was um witnessing my own grief even though I didn't like say it but that was the one time I learned to have some calm and even though I'm not I'm not like religious and going to church when I left home, when I, even when I left college, I went to Spelman College, Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, when I went to school in Iowa, which where I didn't have a, a black community, I just went to the church. I went to this random church every Sunday. And that was where I could meditate, deal with my grief. And what's interesting too, when I think about this, there were kind of like the issues that we're dealing with, with um, George Floyd, Mm -hmm. all the racial upheaval on every spectrum when i was in iowa that's when we had matthew shepherd young man who was um gay and he was lynched or something really crazy white guy I killed yeah. and that i don't know that really had an impact on me because you know he, i'm out there in the midwest too and i'm just like well was something going to happen to me and then in new york we had the Sean Bell case. He was shot. Um, and then two before him, there's Amadou Diallo. Mm -hmm. Amadou Diallo was an immigrant from Somalia. Was he from Somalia? No, he was from Guyana. Or, he was from some part of West Africa. So <laughs> not gonna get it, I, I don't want to get it wrong. But he was falsely accused of having a gun on him. The police profiled him, saw him. He was reaching actually for his wallet they thought he was reaching for a gun they shot him 40 times google it so all right all this happening and this is all this is interesting i'm kind of like putting two and two together so these are two black men this white guy you know who's gay all these people who are go too far into it though yeah but the thing this is this is my whole point of sharing all this oh no 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 worries Oh, oh, my whole point of sharing all this is that I felt like an outlier like these people in Iowa because I didn't have a community. Mm -hmm. And how was I going to deal kind of like existing in a place where I felt as though I had no support. But fortunately, because of that church and an inner drive that I was going to get out in three years, mm -hmm. I did it. So that's kind of part of all of what I'm going to share. And I'll probably edit some more but that's a taste <laughs> i like it I, I love it i love it man and also you guys she's gonna she's gonna be on the podcast too so we're gonna get way deeper into it See, oh yeah we, we've been we've been talking we, <laughs> we've been talking for quite some time <laughs> because man we just vibe like that it is it is always a pleasure to do that uh and so for you guys that are going to be tuning in save the date april 28th april 29th April 30th, you know what I'm saying? These three days, the Global Grief Conference, our second annual 2023. We got some amazing presenters. You know, Jennifer, aka Two Care, Two Hills, going to be up there. And, uh, you know, we're going to rock this weekend. So we want you guys to tune in. Uh, and we've made it easy for you guys to, to register. You can register through Facebook or a QR code. You can you can sign up on a YouTube um, channel. Also, LinkedIn, you know, just look, look up the events, go to Global Grief Conference, um, and just Press that you're going, right? You know what I'm saying? Make it real easy for everyone, you know? And uh, of course, I am Tony Lynch. I am the host of the Global Grief Crops 2023. And as always, um, thank you guys for allowing us to support you. Thank you for your support in all of this. Jennifer, thank you for coming on and sharing um, sharing a little bit about your journey. I'm looking forward to having you on the podcast. And, and, and uh, for all of you guys out there, man, we love you. You guys keep your head up. And just remember, healing is one day at a time, you know, and there's no time limit to your grief. And, you know, so, you know, and don't be afraid to reach out and ask for, ask for support. And until that next time, we love you guys. Thank you. Peace. Peace, peace.